working in Göttingen, and he will talk about almost the same topic. Yeah. Uh, so there is a lot of discussion <laughs> in, in the field. So welcome. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much for the invitation. This is my first time uh, in, at ICTP, even irrespective of the pandemic. Also, thanks to Gili to, to making a good introduction in the, in the field. It should at least raise the motivation why, why there are some very intricate questions there. So I will talk about a, a work. Um, so it's a series of works with my excellent postdoc, David Hartig. Um, so we, we tried to address the same system from a slightly different perspective. I mean, the motivation was a, was a bit different. It wasn't as much as to quantify irreversibility, but rather how to actually make sense of how to, how to physically define the notion of irreversibility when not all degrees of freedom are observed, either in time or in space or both. So the outline is going to be the following. I will have an extended introduction because Edgar yesterday and the day before asked me to maybe put a little bit uh, a little bit more emphasis on, on the background so that everyone can at least um, hopefully get the, the motivation why these kind of questions are really deep and interesting. And then I will try to present two different aspects. Um, so both are systems in or out arbitrarily far from equilibrium. Uh, as, as, in, as Thomas referred to, I will always look at from the perspective that the microscopic fundamental equations of motion are Markovian. And the memory strictly comes from, from projecting out from coarse graining, right? So, um, okay. So I will, I will start with, with a little bit of nomenclature because this is, it's a bit confusing um, or it's not as clear what one means by anything else that it's either not Markov or not in general non-Markov. So the terminology is the following. So Markov processes have no memory. So basically the next state depends only on where you are, right? So this is the only thing you need. Then you have the first generalization, which are semi-Markov processes. In order to describe such a process, you need to know not only where you are, but also how long you have been there in this state, right? But you don't need to know what happened in the past, and this fully determines the future. So it's called semi-Markov. Now you have semi-Markov second order, where you, in addition to, not, to knowing where you are now and how long you have been here, you also need to know where you come from. And then you can go arbitrarily higher order so uh, a process which had infinite range of memory would have an infinite order semi-Markov process because you would need to basically know the entire past, right? So you need to know where you visited the previous state, the one before, and, and so on and so forth. Um, so you can then cover the space of non-Markov processes. I will talk about m processes that are after coarse graining um, evolving on a discrete state space, but you can generalize it to continuous space uh, basically with the same thing. So the logic is the following. Every Markov process is a semi-Markov process, and every semi-Markov process is also a semi-Markov process second order, and so on, but the converse is not true. So a semi-Markov process is not generally a Markov process, and a semi-Markov process of second order is generally not a semi-Markov process. Right? So this is, if, if I'm, I'm, I will try to generalize the concept of stochastic thermodynamics from Markov processes to semi-Markov processes. And by generalizing, I mean they also need to hold for Markov processes. If they only hold for semi-Markov that are not Markov, I didn't generalize anything. I just derived something different, right? So I really mean to cover the blue ground densely, right? Uh, so now the, the idea is the following. So of course, what we want is Markov because simply the full process is specified by a single matrix of numbers. So these are the transition rates, right? And for a complicated system, inferring this from experiments is hard in general irrespectively of whether or not there is memory or not, simply because it's difficult. Semi-Markov processes are more general and, and have a higher resolution, but there, they have, there is a cost. You need to have more, so you need to have two matrices. One matrix tells you what is the likelihood of visiting different states that are adjacent, and then you need another matrix of functions which tell you how likely, how, what is the distribution of time of exiting from each state, every connected state. So this is a huge blow up of information you need to specify such a process. If you think about the semi-Markov process of second order, you need this information for all the incoming states in each state. So basically you need a matrix of numbers, which are the splittings, and then you need a high rank tensor of functions to tell you how, what are the waiting times going. You know? So you lose, you, you gain resolution and you, you sort of gain precision, but you also, explode in the demand of how to parameterize such a process from an experiment, right? So you always try to coarse grain in a way that you are as close as possible to Markov, 
and at the same time that the model is not complete crap, right? Because otherwise, I mean, you can always coarse grain any system to a single state, and it's always Markov. It's just that this state doesn't move, right? So, so this is kind of the, the extreme. And what I will talk about in my, in my talk are only semi-Markov processes, so everything in this blue and dark blue blob, which arise from a coarse graining or a Markov process. Okay, so this is um, what I will talk about. Okay, so now um, another brief remark on, on the coarse graining. Of course, there is no unique coarse graining. There is a continuum of different coarse graining processes. Uh, and I just decide to, to, to basically stick all of these processes in two extremes. One extreme is called lumping. So this is basically you just divide the entire phase space so that the, the state space is just a union of middle states that covers the entire phase space. Sorry, Thomas, you don't see it. Uh, and the other one is called milestoning, where you don't do that. So you, you select small metastable cores and you really ignore the rest. Okay, so a mesostate trajectory, which would be this line, and the current state is encoded in the color. In this case, it's just this, the last visited milestone. So this, this trajectory is blue up until the first time it hits the new milestone, and then it's orange up until the next time it hits for the first time the second milestone. So this is how this is uniquely specifying the milestone trajectories. Okay, so these milestones may may, clo may be closed hypersurfaces, they may be open surfaces. There is basically no rule to that. You you choose them such that the model you get is as close as possible to Markov because you can understand it that you can actually do something to it. Or if this doesn't work, as close as possible to a semi-Markov, right? Um, so it's always a, it's always a compromise. Uh, and the the the, the model you can build also depends on the resolution of the data, of the experimental data you have, because you know you have a temporal resolution, a spatial resolution. So I will not talk about these experimental difficulties which arise, but they're very real from a physical perspective. Okay. So now the problem with lumping, if you look at the community that actually builds these models, so not theoretical physicists, not stochastic thermodynamics communities, but people that actually try to infer models from either experiments or computer simulations, they realize that lumping is really bad simply because it just prevents the emergence of Markov dynamics. And Satya can tell you all about why, because you have these frequent recrossings. And this completely spoils down any exponential dense uh, holding times in, this, in, the, in, the, in the lumped states, right? Um, and so if, if you want to have a Markov process on the lumped space, you need to make a time resolution, which is very poor. So it, the time resolution of the Markov state model must be, must be much longer than any relaxation time uh, in, in the hidden states, in the mesostates. So this imposes a resolution. But even if you can find that, so assuming that you, you build a Markov model that has this uh, very poor time resolution, functionals taken along this coarse grain state space do not agree with the functionals of the original dynamics. Right? So these are, these are two fundamental limitations of these models. The, the good thing is they're easy to build. If you have intuition, you just cut the space. Right? So this is also this is a very strong, uh, strong um, motivation why one should use that. But it is the, the coarse graining paradigm in stochastic thermodynamics. Now, in, in, on the other hand, uh, milestoning actually does lead, so it was invented by mathematicians actually to get as close as possible to Markov processes. And um, there is a rigorous condition on the, in, in, in which case the, the coarse grain process is actually Markov, or almost effectively Markov, is that if the equilibration time within a milestone is very short, compared to the time of changing states. Uh, and if the periods where the microstate, so the, the full uh, microscopic trajectory is not in either one milestone or the other are short. So it means it will not be Markov, but it will have long excursions, either outside and returning to the same milestone or long transition path times commuting from one milestone to the other. Right? But then in this case, you get a semi-Markov process. So they, they also have another, um, um, so they, they can uncover hidden, hidden states in some occasions. I will not talk about that. But uh, what we have found and what, our, what was our interest was the fact that the milestoning actually exactly preserved the microscopic entropy production, right? So this is something we were, we had the result fast, but we, we, it took us two years to understand why. So that, that is what I was trying to talk about. And we still don't understand it fully. I mean, this is not a closed story yet. Uh, and, sorry. And um, for those that may find, um, oh, this thing doesn't work anymore. Ah. Oh, now it will work? Yes. 
now it goes. For those that uh, might find milestoning exotic, I will just try to remind you that uh, Kramers, in his original work, actually did milestoning. He just didn't call it like that. I mean, I don't know who decided the name. So, um, so basically what he did is that he tried to coarse grain a barrier crossing in, in a potential with high barriers, deep wells, in, in a Markov state process for, in order to describe kinetics of chemical reactions. And what he said is that, you know, starting from an equilibrium in one deep well, I just need to look at the crossing current or the first passage time to another minimum. So you have one milestone here, one milestone here. And then you realize, actually, if this barrier is high and sharp, I don't even need the full barrier. So I just expand it around. Let's say it's very sharp. I can expand it to quadratic order. Uh, he extended the integration to the full line. And then the rate he got contains a non-local effect, which is the curvature of the barrier. Right? So this basically says that the, miles, the Kramer's rates, which are typically used in, in stochastic thermodynamics in Markov processes, are basically milestone processes. Because you have one milestone which goes up until a certain point, so this height here is roughly 1 kBT, and another one on the other side, right? So this is very old. It's just that you don't typically think about it this way. So Kramers did not lump states. He really milestoned it. So he already knew that this is the way to do it, right? Um, okay, so this is just as few. The other thing is, is time reversal, um, which we really introduced very nicely. So it's really about this um, asymmetry in systems evolving forward and backward in times. Um, but there is, there is a subtle difference between mathematical time reversibility and dissipation or physical time reversibility. So in other words, in general, one must not just simply read the trajectory backwards, okay? So I will, this is the, the way one quantifies irreversibility is you take the kuhlbeck leibler for the logarithm ratio of the forward path measure divided by the backward path measure. So the average is about the steady state ensemble, in this case, ensemble of infinitely long forward paths. And only if one selects this exclamation mark, which, which is a very subtle thing, I used explicitly an exclamation mark, one actually gets the steady state uh, end reproduction this way. And a simple example why this is so problematic is take a Newtonian trajectory, okay, so a particle having a velocity and a position and read the trajectory backwards. We get a trajectory that is physically impossible. It has probability zero because we get a particle moving backwards which has a momentum looking forwards, right? So it's well known that this is easily remedied because you just have to flip momentum. So momenta are odd under time reversal. So this is well known and in, in a way obvious. Um, but it highlights nicely that there is a dis distinction between just mathematical irreversibility of trajectories and physical irreversibility or dissipation. And this doesn't include only systems with momenta, but rather overdamped systems if there are magnetic fields. So you also need to flip the magnetic field so the magnetic field doesn't um, exert a f uh, uh, doesn't perform work on a charged particle, uh, but if you don't invert the field, you still get a positive energy reproduction if you read the trajectory backwards. So what we wanted to ask is, what happens with memory? Okay, so if I ignore now degrees of freedom, what is this exclamation mark? Is there any? And if it is, what is it? And what does it mean? Okay, so this is a very deep question, and it took us so the entire project took more than three years. And getting all the proof took only maybe one and a half years, and it took us two years to understand what they mean. So, and we, we are still not fully there. Right? So to give you a bit of an intuition about how, how this end reproduction, steady state end reproduction looks like in Markov systems, I first look at the, at the Langevin equation. This is overdamped. I write it here as stochastic differential simply because, um, well, this thing is nowhere differentiable. The probability one, this is always infinity if I divide by dt, but that is just a mathematical concern. And um, if, you, if, you now, if you now look at the dissipation of an of a overdamped Brownian system, you can really use the classical time reversal without any tricks. If you don't have a magnetic field and no momentum, you just look at the you know, log ratio forward path, backward path. And what you get is this. Uh, and this, is the, this relates the, the stochastic path integral along such a diffusive trajectory um, which is basically a force integrated along a stochastic trajectory up until time t with the entropy change in the bath. Okay, it, to, to get some intuition what this means, is best if you look at closed trajectories. Okay, so I take trajectories which start and end at the same time, uh, at the same point, sorry. And if this force is a gradient of the potential, right, so a system of base detail balance, and this is a Stratonovich integral, so it's just, it behaves like a normal integral, you see that closing any path in a detailed balance system changes, causes no entropy change in the bath. So this means any cycle 
returns both the system and the bath to the same point. If this is not a gradient field, then you have some, then you have some entropy change net in the bath, right? So the system returns to the same point, but you have dissipated something into the bath, or, or vice versa if, if the change is otherwise. So this is the intuition. Now, if, if you have a coarse grain state space, a discrete process, there is no unique way how to do that. So there is one, one paradigm that works for Markov processes. This is called the local detail balance. This doesn't imply global detail balance. This just means if you look at pairs of states, they are as if they were in local detail balance. And the paradigm says that the log ratio of the forward rate divided by the backward rate is related to the entropy change of the transition. Okay? And the idea here is that this should work as soon as the relaxation in those mesostates is very fast compared to the transitions. So everything, as the transition happens, all the degrees of freedom that are not observed are instantaneously at the equilibrium, at the temperature of the bath at all times. Okay, so this is basically what, what the paradigm of stochastic thermodynamics is. And if you put this into the machinery, you calculate out, you get the laws of thermodynamics as you would like them, first, second, whatever. Okay? So now the point is here that this connects stochastic dynamics, so the left-hand side, with thermodynamics, the right-hand side. So now the question is, what happens if you do not have time scale separation? Right? So this is basically my talk. And first I will give a motivation when this happens, because um, I'm not trying to say that every process is, um, every coarse grain process will be a normal Markov process. Actually, typically, if, if the barrier is high, sharp, and the minimal well of time, you always get a Markov process. So it works. Uh, for example, here, this is a double well. It's a diffusive trajectory um, commuting between two minima. Um, and the subtlety is that if you look at the exit time from either of these states, the process will be Markov when this exit time is exponential, approximately exponential, like here. You know, so this exponential here has the same mean value as the, as the distribution in blue. Um, but you see that the, the dwell time, so this is basically the time the trajectory spends before a successful transition is the long. So this is meaning you reach local equilibrium and the transition is very fast. Okay, you, this is the black bar, you basically don't see it. But the total exit time is the dwell time plus the transition time, right? So if, if you want to have Markov processes, this transition time must be very short. It must be negligible compared to the dwell time. Okay, so this is well known. Uh, again, the thing stalls. Ah, okay. So now the point is that even when this is the case, so up until maybe 10 years ago now, people have started nevertheless to measure the statistics of these small black bars here. Even if there is exponential statistics. In protein folding, Felix and, and Kaiser did it even out of equilibrium. Um, you know, people looked at this in the context of, of uh, catch bonds where you basically based on the statistics of the duration of these things, you can see if there are parallel pathways between two states. I mean, this is a very, the, the physical content in the statistics of these very small bars, even if the statistics is exponential, is very rich, right? But this is not what I'm interested in. I'm interested in what happens if they are not. And this happens very easily. And this is what the modeler's nightmare is. Whenever the barrier here is rugged or extended flat on top, then you have these frequent revisitations and you spend a lot of time out of the milestone, then you see the statistics is not exponential, right? And what also happens that if you drive one transition in one direction very strongly, so you tilt one stable uh, mesostate, um, then the, the dwell time is shorter. So in both cases, this condition is violated. So the black bars are not much smaller now than the orange bars. And this we call mild violations of Markovianity. Uh, what, what, when things really go sour is when you have parallel pathways. So you have two paths connecting the same pair of states. And one path is fast, the other path is slow. Like, for example, in the catch bonds. You know, catch bonds are non-covalent bonds, which have this bizarre property that if you pull on them weakly, they break immediately. But if you pull very strong, they become very resilient. Right? So this is very counterintuitive. And how one can explain that is that you know, pulling on strain just puts more probability on the slow path and then the system spends a very long time on the transition path. And this we call strong violation. So whenever you have either of those on at least one transition in the network, you don't have to have it everywhere. The entire process becomes semi-Markov because of that. Okay. Uh, so we, we cannot describe this in full generality um, simply because uh, it's, it's too complicated. So what we started with is a, is a diffusion process on a graph. 
So this is an anti to Langevin equation. It's overdamped. It, the, the force field and the diffusion landscape is quenched in the graph. So whenever you have, it's always there. So there is no annealing there. Uh, so this is how a trajectory looks like. Um, this is anti-ETO. You shouldn't worry about that. That is um, just the, uh, the way you propagate things. And how you should understand this from a physical perspective is that there is always some reaction coordinate that you can find between two mesostates. And this x here is just a progress variable along this correct co uh, reaction coordinate. And uh, this, this model becomes a good representation whenever all the orthogonal degrees of freedom along these reaction coordinates between the pairs of states are fast compared to the, to the progress, right? Anyway, so now what we do is we do milestoning where we put milestones into the, into the vertices. So this means whenever a trajectory passes there, we know it's there. So this is how we put it. And we imagine a Gedanken experiment where we have detectors with different colors in the vertices. And whenever a trajectory passes a vertex, you see a, a flash of a color. Then you just align those flashes on a, on a timeline. And the, the state change is basically, the state is the same as long as the flashes are the same color. When the color changes, you have a state change. Very simple, right? Uh, what you get out is our waiting time distributions out of each of those states are here non-exponential because this, only this connection here, 3-1, has a, has a rugged barrier. So this is how we have defined it. But funny enough, the, not only this transition is now non-exponential, but also all other transitions out of state three are, are non-exponential. So this thing is non-local, right? So this is not something, this is a, a bit subtle. Um, so it's not exponential, therefore it's not Markov. Gili explained this, so I don't have to go about it. And the dynamics you get out of that is just a generalized master equation on a level of probability density. So this has been analyzed by, um, phenomenologically by Landmann, Montreux, and Schlesinger in the late 70s. So we didn't invent anything new there. Um, but um, we wanted to know what to feed in the dynamics. So what are the waiting times or what are the splittings? Okay, and then if the slide lets me, I will go further. Okay, so this is now the main results and all the results I will show. Um, so by doing the coarse graining, it's a, it's a massive, the proof is very long. I will not even explain how we did that. What emerges is the following. So this is the directional waiting time density. So this is the waiting time you spend in I before transiting in J, which is the conditional first passage time divided by the splitting probability to actually go there, is a sum of two statistically independent terms. One is the dwell time, the other one is the transition time. So they are statistically independent. As soon as you condition on the next state, so as soon as you decide where to go, they are independent. And then there, is, there are three symmetries. One is we call uh, ter thermodynamic consistency which basically relate the logarithm ratio of the splitting probabilities to some conservative part, and everything that is in the waiting times is in this conservative part. This was very difficult to see. So all the contribution of waiting times enter conservatively. So if you close a loop, this cannot contribute to the entropy production, to physical entropy production, simply because they are, this is the affinity part, if you wish, in Markov state process. This is force integrated along the link. And if the process is Markov, this exactly reduces to local detail balance. So if, if the process is Markov, this is the generalization of local detail balance for semi-Markov. The, the symmetry two tells that the dwell time is just a state variable, so it doesn't depend on where you go next, it's just where you are. And the symmetry three is the symmetry of transition path time. So the, the, the statistics of the forward path is identical in law to the statistics of the backward path. And this has been proven before, so this is not a new result. This has been proven by, uh, by this work in 2006. Okay, this doesn't work further. Ah. Okay, so now, now coming back to this entropy production and symmetry. So you see that these this waiting times are not symmetric. So the waiting time of exiting three to one and three to two, they are different. You see this in this picture, right? And um, there was this work by Wang and Qian in 2007 where they calculated those kulbeck leibler divergence without this exclamation mark, just taking the forward, backward kulbeck leibler divergence, and the steady state dissipation, and they realized that it's larger, right? It should, the inequality should look in the other way around. So they didn't understand what's going on, but they say that the, you know, a positive value of the kulbeck leibler cannot imply broken detailed balance. In particular, they construct a detailed balance example where there was a zero here. Right, so it cannot be, and when you coarse grain, you know, Gilles, you said it sometimes, if you coarse grain, you cannot get an entropy that is higher. It's just not possible, it's nonsense. 
right? So what is then, what is then missing? What is the exclamation mark? And this took us very long, and what we realized that coarse graining and time reversal do not commute. So if you, if you first invert, so if you coarse grain the backward in time microscopic trajectory, you get a different trajectory. In other words, only the transition paths, they are all under time reversal, right? So the, the, this, is the, this is the exclamation mark. The dwell periods are completely symmetric, but the transition paths, you see these are the shaded areas, they are odd. So whenever you calculate the, the dissipation, the only thing you need, you need to take into account the oddness of the transition periods. And if you do that, then first here there is an equality sign. So this is what I have here, right? So they are really, the, this preserves the microscopic steady state. So this is the microscopic steady state entropy production, and this is the entropy production rate in the coarse grain dynamics. Um, and also if you hide cycles, so if, if I now coarse grain in a way that some states I leave out and therefore I mask cycles, then this inequality points into the correct direction. So it's not a greater or less, but uh, sorry, yes, less than equal. So you, you get the correct direction. So this only holds for semi-Markov processes. If I now perform the coarse graining in a different way, I can coarse grain a system such that I get no, that we call this kinetic hysteresis, by the way, that we get no kinetic hysteresis. For example, if I decide to, to make a state change in half of these intervals, then I get forward and backward exactly the same trajectory. The problem is this happens for both transition paths and the process is not semi-Markov anymore. It's semi-Markov second order. I need to know where I came from and where I go. And the symmetries I showed on the previous slides, they imply that the asymmetric waiting times and a semi-Markov process that arrive that arises as a coarse graining of Markov dynamics are only possible in the presence of kinetic hysteresis. So for semi-Markov processes, this is inherent. It's just there, okay? So I have no time to go there now, but uh, I will go directly to my, uh, I try, it doesn't work. <laughs> so it's not that I don't want to. So in the last part, I just wanted to show that local detail balance for Markov processes is only a necessary condition, but it's not a sufficient condition. So there is a concrete, uh, there is a, direct counter example to that, where you have a, I'm trying to move forward. This is basically the, the spectral gap. The yeah. pointer is Yeah, the pointer is, I don't know what this is. Maybe, this maybe is. Yeah, maybe. I'm just afraid that now it will jump several, okay, am I there already? Yes, here, okay. So, and here, here are the conclusions. Um, so coarse graining and time reversal in general do not commute. Right, so there are cases where they commute, like Markov processes um, and, and other things, but they are not, this is not true in general when you have memory. Uh, now we have solved the problem for semi-Markov processes, also quite frankly not in full generality because you know, this is, there is no time dependent potentials there. There are many things that are still missing, even more things that are still not understood. Uh, what I didn't show you, but I want to just advertise it that the time scale separation is, is a necessary but not a sufficient condition for, for the emergence of local detail balance in Markov processes. So this relates Markov processes and stochastic thermodynamics. And that milestoning is actually thermodynamically consistent even if the process is not Markov. Um, so the, the reason why this is the case is that even though you, you neglect parts of the trajectory where they are, the, the entire information is still exactly encoded in the splitting probabilities. So how the microstate actually visits states first, so for the probability that I go from I to J first, but not to all the other adjacent states. In the steady state properties, this is fully encoded. So this is the reason why milestoning, the, the, um, the origin is in probabilistic potential theory, but this is the reason why, why this is the case, why it's thermodynamically consistent. Uh, and and I thank you for your attention. I apologize for being four minutes over time. And um, I thank for the funding, uh, the. German Research Foundation, the Max Planck Society, and the Studienstiftung. Thank you very much for a very interesting talk. Um, questions from students? <laughs> okay, let's go. So in going from lumping to this milestone, is there an optimal recipe for shrinking the states down to given size? Or? Rigorously, no. You can actually prove that you cannot know. 
So not that there is, doesn't exist, but that you cannot tell whether it exists one or not. The, the thing is that um, from experience, so toy models, yes, right? So if you, if you give me the microscopic model so I know what happens, then I can give you a very good guess and potentially in certain cases we can prove that it's optimal. But if you, if you have an experimental observation where you do not, a priori, do not see everything, right? Um, you don't see fast intermediates because of time resolution or any other thing. Uh, it's, it's a matter of trial and error. And, and the worst thing is that typically people have to, in order to build those models for molecular machines, people need to combine different methods with different spatial temporal resolution. So you have molecular dynamics going, so I don't know, say a couple of hundred nanoseconds, and then you have fluorescent spectroscopy going milliseconds, or force spectroscopy milliseconds, microseconds. Um, and then, you know, each of those sees a different resolution and different substates. So it's really a matter of, um, they, so the, the modelers have a very difficult job there. Doing the theory is trivial compared to that, I mean. Okay, thank you. So I have a, I have a question about uh, the, the model you started with, so this diffusion on the graph. So you said it's already, uh, essentially you are taking one reaction coordinate connecting uh, yeah. each ah, two yeah. states, right? Yeah, the, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, that one. So which kind of models do you think this is a good representation for? Because in general, when you start for a system where you have multiple uh, metastable states, you know that transition from one state to the other and the reverse one, they do not follow the same reaction coordinate. This yeah, is happening only if there is reversibility, yeah, so yeah. everything is equilibrium. So yeah, which yeah. kind of models do we want to describe with this? I mean, this? Pa parallel, parallel paths in that sense are not problematic. This, this one can deal with exactly the same way. But I agree that the, you know, if you have a path predominantly going this way and the backwards path going that way, having two channels is not a problem for the theory. So this is not per se a problem. Um, the problem is actually that if the, if the dynamics that is orthogonal to those two paths is not much faster, then, you know, if, if basically if you have Brownian paths without a potential, they will not go in a straight tube, right? They will be pretty scattered. So there it fails. Um, so it's always, if you have like, a, like an instant tone tube, which is a good representation, but the good thing is, you know, this is a follow-up work that will follow soon. We replace now these links by a Markov state network. So if you now, if I, instead of this line, which is a 1D process, I put in a, a Markov state network, not a 1D chain, mm -hmm. but some network, the results are, remain unaffected. Uh, the, 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 the thing is just, it's just dry algebra there. So it's little insight, but you can basically, the formulas don't change at all. I don't have to change anything. And I think that is to the extent that the new microscopic Markov network is a good representation of the dynamics, um, it's, it's more general, right? The, but just to clarify, I'm not implying that one can actually resolve that. That would be a bit backwards. I just say that what one can resolve, one can, to some good agreement, describe by such a process. So this is the statement I'm trying to make. Right? But in reality, if you don't know where the paths go, you know, you can only try, you, you try it and you see how it agrees, so. Uh, okay, thanks. I think we have time for one more question, uh, but I think Satya will ask first. Yeah. So, so let, okay, let me ask you sort of a very general question. Yeah. I mean, imagine that I'm an experimentalist, okay? So <laughs> uh, I just give you a time series. Yeah. Okay. Maybe as long as you want, a long time series. Is there any way to, for a practical way to figure out if the underlying process is Markov or semi-Markov or higher order Markov? Okay. Yeah, I mean, well, it, yes, you can. The way to do it, you know, the, you, you know this, this concept of hidden Markov modeling. Yes. You know, you can generalize it to hidden semi-Markov modeling. Right? So this just, it's, it's technically more demanding, but you can just try to find the best possible hidden semi-Markov network and the best possible Markov network. And then you, the quantifying the memory is trivial. I mean, we did this in my group. You, you can, I, I didn't talk about it, but uh, if you just have a time series, looking, uh, def def quantifying how much non-Markovian it is is trivial because um, you can construct a surrogate process, which is basically the chapman kolmogorov propagator from the true time series, and then compare the propagator with the original propagator. So if, it's, if the process at some scale is Markov, then the, the kullback leibler between the two propagators is the same. And by tuning the, the extra time, which doesn't exist in Markov processes, but does in this artificial Chapman-Komogorov construction, you can actually probe exactly 
past which scale it becomes Markov, right? So this is not a zero one condition, right? Because you have experimental noise. So it's not that you say, okay, this is perfectly Markov. This is perfectly non-Markov. But given a time spatial resolution and your ignorance, if you wish, so margin, you can at least say this is significantly non-Markov on this temporal scale, for example. Right? This you can do. Okay, for the sake of time, I think we should go for a coffee break. Yes, absolutely. So. <laughs> I need it as well. You can ask more questions in the coffee break sure. to Aljas. Absolutely. Uh, thanks a lot uh, again for your talk. <laughs> <laughs>